Hello, my friends. Welcome back after a, uh, well, it was a tough week for me, but, uh, I feel like forgiveness is a vibe that, uh, really helps things get a lot better. So that's where I'm sitting now. And, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be back in the action and have you here with me for some more cybersecurity-ing. Um, today is not specifically cybersecurity, but you better know this stuff, um, before, hopefully, you get into the field. And so we're talking about how when you sit there and, uh, type google.com, enter, wow, Google pops up. Uh, it seems so quick and easy and fast, but, uh, it is all of those things, but it's because of all the underlying technologies that uh, make that occur. So we're going to go over just some basic networking. I think I'm just trying to give the, the gist of some of the systems happening, some of the turtles involved in that process. Um, but there's a lot of great resources out on the internet to further your understanding of the network. And honestly, I could probably use a refresher myself. So, onward. Okay. All right. So, yeah, y'all know this stuff. You're your teacher. I'm just a lady on the internet who likes uh, blabbing about cybersecurity. And, uh, yeah, I, I, had a, I had a talk on enterprise cybersecurity and incident response with the organization Code Day on Friday. And, uh, yeah, I just, I really do like this message of just, uh, you end up having to teach yourself most, most of the things the teacher, as much as they can, can try and pull things out of their brain and insert as much as possible into you. But really it's not about replicating what's in the teacher's head. It's about, you know, creating in your head, uh, all the knowledge that you'll need to do the things you want to do with tech. So let's get into how type website, press enter, bam, works. Uh, so breaking it up into three parts as per usual, that's talking to your network first before it gets out to the interwebs, uh, talking to their network, uh, where the interwebs is talking to you. And last piece, just briefly, because we don't really have that much time and I, I, I estimated myself uh, talking a lot this one because there's a lot of pieces. Um, so the network's talking to you part we'll briefly touch on, but uh, that's just after the connection is made, what goes on. So uh, talking to your network, uh, as surprising as it may seem, there is a lot going on on your internal network to uh, translate things so that you can talk to the internet, your cell phone can talk to the internet, your Xbox can talk to the internet, your refrigerator can, can talk to your internet, your cat collar can, can talk to the internet. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how some of the pieces work together before you get out of your network. Uh, I'm hoping I remember where all the, because <laughs> Windows 10 really moved a lot of things around, especially related to networking that drives me insane. Um, but, uh, I'll show a little bit of that. I can't go into detail as much because now I use a, a mesh router called Eero that doesn't have like an administration panel. It's all an app on your phone, which is cool. And it does work really well, but, uh, I can't show you as much of the nitty gritty on the router side as I would like. So, um, TCP IP, this is a really like, it was really forward thinking. Like, how do we do all of the things? Um, I, I, I talked on Friday to those folks about the CIA triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability and uh, TCP IP, it was really well thought out and really accounts for basically all three of those possible and in different ways. It allows for uh, a, f a little bit of freedom in how that's done. The most, uh, well, we're basically just, when I'm talking, I realize there are far more protocols and ways things can go. I'm just going to talk about mainly TCP um, because it is generally the thing uh, we're using to connect uh, all around. But, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, I believe, 
uh, developed in the 80s, early 80s, possibly by DARPA. I know that the internet, you know, it's always said, oh, yeah, the, the, the army made DARPA and uh, the DARPA made the internet. And it's a grand conspiracy when really it's just a bunch of uh, nerds who really wanted to network things together in a decentralized fashion came up with TCP IP. And it's brilliant and it's super cool and we still use it today. Uh, so just a little bit of differentiation. You might have heard of IPv4 versus IPv6. Uh, IPv4 is the uh, what we've talked about in the past with the 0 to 255 dot 0 to 255 dot 0 to 255 dot 0 to 255. And uh, Plops corrected me on the number of uh, addresses. In a class A, there's 16 million. So I think it's 255 times 16 million, question mark. A decent amount of IP addresses, but we are running out, uh, especially because you sort of like the IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, I believe that's the acronym, uh, sort of leases out these IPs, and it's a generally independent organization made up of people from all different aspects of tech. So it's meant to be a sort of like unbiased ish third party uh, to sort of distribute IPs across the, the world. But we are starting to run out for the purposes we're, we're utilizing them for, uh, especially when you consider, I mean, there are basically more devices than there are humans now. Uh, and that's just getting more insane because every human is going to be connected to, you know, 10, 50 devices once Internet of Things really starts blowing up. So uh, now we really need a lot more space. So IPv6 uh, vastly increases the number of available IP addresses by an order of magnitude, where even if we like had another exponential growth, it is a 10 with a lot more zeros on the end, <laughs> uh, which will allow for more IPs to be leased and IP spaces to be uh, created and taken. Uh, IPv4, I still personally think it is going to stick around as an internal network uh, protocol. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, the private and internal IP space a little bit. But uh, yeah, you might have heard this and uh, IPv6 is coming, but they've basically said that for the last 20 years. So uh, I'm sure it'll be another 10 before we're actually forced to switch. Um, so. TCP IP rests upon the OSI seven layer model. And if you're going through going for your network plus or your CCNA, you'll definitely have this drilled into you pretty hard. And it is important, uh, especially to understand uh, how the computer interprets data and where data is sitting, where and uh, what state it is in. There are seven layers. Surprise. Uh, people have no, knocked this down into a simplified four version format, which makes sense in a lot of ways. But traditionally, you've got uh, physical. So that's the actual data sitting in space. That is the uh, light going over the cable, the electricity over going over the cable. That is the Wi-Fi signal uh, in the air. Uh, that's the physical OSI layer one. So if you were in a Faraday cage, you would be having an OSI layer one problem. <laughs> uh, data link is uh, basically the, the hardware ID that is accepting or sending the connections. That is the MAC, M-A-C address uh, of your network interface card. Uh, this is not secure at any point. Macs can be spoofed, uh, made up. It doesn't really matter. It's interesting that um, you know some manufacturers might uh, reserve like a have the same repeating start of a Mac address and then just sequentially number them off the line with with new numbers. Uh, so that's that. Then you've got the network, and that's where we're we're seeing uh, the IP address come into play. Uh, we haven't hit the TCP part yet, um, but that uh, allows addressing beyond the MAC address, uh, which is linked to hardware. IP address is uh, kind of something that is assigned or given, or uh, there's a state given to a certain MAC, uh, and that can be changed and uh, fluid. And then transport layer, that's the TCP part. Uh, the, the other most common protocol is called UDP, uh, User Datagram protocol. Uh, TCP is transmission control protocol. The major difference between TCP and UDP is TCP is what they call a stateful connection. It has a state. 
it has this packet goes and then this packet, then this packet, then this packet, and it has uh, a way of checking to make sure that that is preserved. The order is preserved, the data is preserved. That's how you can make sure a file that you download from the internet has the, ex you have downloaded the exact same file that was on the other end because the other one, UDP, um, is stateless. Uh, it does not maintain a state, it just throws packets. And uh, if you whatever you get, uh, great, you got more of the packets. Um, most streaming protocols are UDP. Uh, YouTube, I believe, is UDP. Uh, Spotify, uh, voice over IP. And the idea is because TCP requires sort of like computational resources to verify that, you know, something is happening in the way that it should, UDP is just shooting it out and hopefully you get everything on the other end and it decodes correctly. When there's, uh, when you start losing packets, that's when uh, in your streaming quality, you see like the, the artifacts appear or in, in voice or audio, you hear the robotic sound, it sort of loses its quality. Um, that is a signal loss in the UDP. Uh, then you've got session, which uh, UDP doesn't care about, uh, but that's uh, for TCP IP. We're, we're sort of keeping track of uh, building up a state or like uh, getting to an encrypted connection. We, we have to have a protocol or a place in the protocol to navigate that. And then presentation. Uh, I always confuse presentation and application. I believe presentation is like literally like the file type, like what what kind of file are you or are you transferring across that line? And then application is literally your application interpreting the file and letting you see it and interact with it and do stuff. So that's a lot of words and uh, it's kind of hard to keep those in track. And there's a bunch of cool acronyms. Uh, there's a pizza one that was okay. But uh, over the course of my studies, I've found that uh, the coolest acronym or mnemonic device to remember this is people don't need those stupid packets anyway, which also doubles as a definition for UDP. So for that one, that one is super easy to remember for me, um, especially because it's also related to UDP. So you've got another thing sort of connecting there, but people don't need those stupid packets anyway, aka physical data link, network, transport, session, presentation, application. And uh, that's just the nitty gritty, how it works. Uh, it's it's good to know this stuff. It is the fundamental building blocks. Uh, I think this stuff is more fun, uh, a few layers up. There's a lot of cool, interesting attacks and detections that happen on different layers of the stack. So especially if you're getting familiar with how attacks work and how they abuse different layers, um, it's really handy to get a solid understanding there. Uh, next up, I wanted to talk about the private IP space. This is also referenced as RFC 1918. Uh, RFC stands for Request for Comments, and it is the system by which internet uh, standardized global internet protocols are discussed and solidified and become sort of like the, the standard standardized communication logic. So RFC 19, uh, there's RFCs for IPv4, there's RFCs for IPv6, there's just RFCs for all sorts of things. And they always have lots of data and they're, they're very dense and technical, but uh, I feel like RFC 1918 is one of the most important ones to know, even by name, because it's uh, generally referred to that way. Oh wow, I can buy followers and become famous! Just what I've always wanted! Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, really, this is, we, we talked about this previously with the various private IP spaces of uh, the one you might be familiar with with your router is the 192.168.x.x. That's a I, private IP space. You've got uh, 172.16 through 172.31 dot anything after that, those is another private IP space. And the last one is 10 dot anything. Anything that starts with 10 dot is an internal IP space. Um, so that, you know, you can have the IP address for like your router, for example, has a public IP that was assigned by your internet service provider but inside your own network, you could have 
millions of machines, really, if you wanted to, with the 10 dot space. Uh, but usually because your internal home router system is not going to have 10,000 devices, you can usually just rely on 192.168 because it's big enough for your purposes. Um, but uh, it's really cool and you definitely need to know that. Oh God, there's some people I know who do not know this. And uh, there are some people I don't know, but I know of them who have blocked an internal IP and taken down multinational corporations for a few hours, which costs millions of dollars. So uh, just knowing that 10 dot or 172.16 through 31 and 192.168, those are internal, don't block those unless you're purposely isolating a machine that's being bad. Uh, so let's dive into your router and we'll go a little bit over, uh, like actually on my computer, the, the details of the connection. So it's doing a few things for us, the router. Uh, it's doing network address translation or NAT. And this is how your router is able to be a public IP address that was assigned by your ISP and also have IPs inside like 192.168.1.1 or, or one dot, let's say you're 11, because you like the number 11, uh, translate when it gets sent out from your public IP, which is not your private IP, then it gets sent to who knows where, comes back and is like, hey, this was for, uh, for you, but the router needs to get it back to the person who actually submitted the request to the router. So the router is performing network address translation to make sure packets get to the right place. Um, oftentimes it utilizes the Mac address to do so because the hardware Mac address on the data link layer is going to stay the same. So it knows, oh, uh, here, I've got this, this packet you requested. It has your Mac address on it. Um, next up is uh, DHCP uh, slash the gateway. I'm not super certain how to distinguish these two things apart, but the gateway is in, in a common home router setup. The gateway is how your, how you on your network talks to the gateway, which goes out to the internet or to the next layer in the network stack. Um, so often, most of the time, the gateway, for example, like let's, let's pull up my, uh, my connection here. Network adapters. God, I hate that it doesn't follow the same way it used to. Uh, so adapter options. If I go to my Wi-Fi here, I look at the details. So we can see here, which this was a little bit bigger, but uh, 192.168.7.218 is the IP address of the machine I am on right now. Um, the gateway, that is my router, uh, 7.1. The router or the gateway is usually going to be dot one or dot two five five most of the time one but uh it's basically what i need to talk to first to get out to the next layer above or around or what have you but you can sort of nest gateways in, upon gateways so that you can separate out your network in a logical fashion um dhcp is dynamic host configuration protocol and what that does, and usually your router performs this function as well, is it sits in a place so that when something gets plugged into your network, it goes like, hey, where do I go? What do I do? What's going on? And the DHCP server is like, oh, you sweet child, come to me and I shall give you all the configuration settings you desire. And here, I bestow upon you an IP address that you may use to talk to the internet. Uh, so the DHCP server and the gateway are often the same thing in a home network setup, but that is not the case on an enterprise level and all, all the time. Uh, what else we got on this slide? Uh, uh, so firewall, you may be familiar with the premise of a firewall. Basically, I don't know if I should draw a picture. I'm already 20 minutes in. I don't know if I should spend a picture on this one. Uh, so a firewall just sits somewhere and has a list of rules, usually called an access control list, uh, that it determines whether traffic going across it is allowed or not. Um, 
So, for example, your router has probably, uh, hopefully, a rule to deny all outbound to inbound traffic. So any traffic from the internet that just hits your IP address and is like, hey, I want, I want inside. I want to see what's inside. Your router is like, no, I didn't talk to you, so we're not going to talk to you. Talk to the hand, aka the firewall, and go away. But it has a rule for inbound connections when it reaches out to outside. Sure, go ahead, let those through. Um, and, and now that the conversation has been made, I see that it's you know initiated by one of my people, I will allow it to keep continuing. So that's basically what a firewall does. Um, there's obviously ways to make more and more secure policies uh, on an enterprise level. They may only allow certain certain protocols to talk. But uh, yeah, that's the premise. Your router does it for you. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about port forwarding and UPnP in relation to the firewall because it's uh, relevant. Um, I was introduced to the concept of port forwarding thanks to uh, playing video games on the internet. There is often uh, issues with multiplayer gaming uh, because there are outside connections initiating to your machine so that you can link up and play a multiplayer game. Oftentimes you have to uh, create a port forwarding rule so that it goes to the correct machine. So usually what you would do with port forwarding is give yourself a static IP address. So uh, I think I'm on automatic right now because I don't play any games that require this. But you would want a static IP address, so I don't talk. I tell DHCP, "Hey, I'm 7.11, and there's nothing you're going to do about it, unless 7.11 was already reserved, and it will say too bad." But uh, usually, you set a static IP address so your machine sits in the same place on the network all the time, and you can give it a a, a lease, a DHCP lease, so it stays to that MAC address, and then. You make a rule so that if this port, let's say 32,000, I think is one of the old Battle.net ones for StarCraft. Um, if you see a, a port 32,000 request coming in from outbound to inbound, forward it to 7.11 because that's where Haley's at and she wants to play StarCraft. Um, this still uh, can be useful and you may have to do it for games like Call of Duty and uh, those types of games. Sometimes it's called NAT strict and NAT open and you get a better connection when I think it's NAT strict. I, I don't remember which one is which, but regardless, port forwarding is basically telling your firewall like, hey, if this port shows up, then it's for me. Just let me know and I'll, I'll deal with it. Uh, UPnP is uh, U plug and play. Uh, PnP usually stands for plug and play in tech land, but that is usually on by default, and that's to make it so it's a lot easier to set up IoT devices because what IoT usually, what we use it for nowadays, is uh, say you got a smart fridge that lets you know when something's going to expire or something. I don't know. Um, I don't use these products, but uh, let's say there's an app that goes with your smart fridge and you want to be able to anywhere you go when you when you have cell data or Wi-Fi, you want to be able to check what's in your fridge. Maybe it has like a camera inside. That'd be kind of cool. Um, so you want to check what's inside your fridge. So the IoT device, if UPnP is enabled, has poked a hole and basically created a for a forwarding port for itself because it, it accessed and authorized internally, the, the router generally can be like, okay, I can probably trust you and allow it to create a hole in the firewall so that something outside the app could talk back to the IoT device. The problem is that IoT devices are notoriously insecure. It's getting better than it ever has been, but it's still pretty bad. And uh, if those holes exist, um, we looked at Shodan.io last month, and uh, yeah, you'll see those holes. So if a vulnerability happens or there's a default uh, administrator password that can be accessed from the internet, that device is getting pwned and uh, they can leverage uh, things inside your network. 
hopefully not too bad. It really depends on the vulnerability. But just so you know, UPnP is a thing to make your life easier, but also could make things insecure. All right, 25 minutes. I will try to zoom up to the handshake. So, um, yeah, I guess I can slide through this. So next up is DNS. So actually probably just going to take this out of slides too. So DNS, if you're not super familiar, is how the internet translates IP addresses, which are difficult to remember, <laughs> to domain names like uh, DuckDuckGo or Microsoft or Yahoo or Gmail or what have you. All of those technically lead back to IP addresses. When you type google.com, you are not going to google.com. You are, you are hitting the DNS record for google.com that leads you to an IP address that is where Google server sits that talks to you. Uh, so uh, DNS is basically, I mean, let's just look at a DNS record for Google. Uh, so my favorite is central ops, but if I look up the DNS record for Google, I've got the domain record, uh, which is who registered the domain. Uh, I've got the, the who is on the domain, uh, goes back to Google and then I've got the network who is record. So that's the IP address record. So it looked ahead and found out what the IP address and then looked up the IP address and you can see uh, Google owns this entire net range amongst many others, but uh, 172.217, anything that prefixes with that, I guess is owned by Google. Uh, I think Apple is 13, the entire 13 space. Uh, we can look at Apple in a sec, but anyhow, these are the DNS records down here. And basically this is a system of trees um, where you've got uh, authoritative name servers on the top that uh, are sort of the end-all be-all of distributing DNS down the tree. So you have, it's a decentralized system, so there are lots of DNS servers that all talk to each other so that they, so if one goes down, you could realistically still go to a website, even if one of the DNS servers that holds its authoritative record is down. I mean, it's really tur another instance of turtles all the way down. It's a really brilliant system but you've basically got like a, a top level domain for dot coms, dot biz, dot everything has a top level like domain server that knows what all the TL, what all the dot coms are, dot nets. And then it sort of distributes that information down. DNS servers cache those records so that they don't have to keep looking them up every time, especially ones that are relatively common. They still should check because there is a thing where you can poison DNS and that's where you insert a fake record and for a limited amount of time based on the caching uh, cycle, you could poison a record so that Google.com, I mean, it would be very difficult to do to them, but Google.com goes to uh, bad Google.com and does bad things instead. Um, DNS is its, is its own nightmare beast that I'm not even going to try to cover because it's a nightmare beast. And I do have a link at the end for a, a kitty cat who explains DNS to you um, that I would uh, much, much prefer them to expound upon their knowledge because it is far vaster than I. But regardless, uh, you set your DNS uh, address if your, if your router does not. Uh, so your router oftentimes will use as a DNS server whatever gets assigned to it by your ISP. Uh, ISP DNS is, uh, uh, many of them serve you ads based through the DNS cycle, which is just cruel, unusual. Um, but I tend to use 1.1.1.1, which is Cloudflare, and they say it's private and they don't track it. They say that, but uh, I've been disappointed before. Uh, the next one I have here is 8.8.8.8, .8 which is Google, who definitely is uh, harvesting some sort of metadata about that. But that's why I use 1.1.1 first, and then 8.8.8. .8 Cloudflare and Google are both very, very large companies, and you may actually see a speed improvement in your network connection just because uh, their servers are real snappy and they've got them all over the world. So uh, you can 
you can tell your your router which DNS servers to use. Otherwise, you'll get the default, which is often your ISP. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm at 30 minutes. So this is the part that's uh, that gets spiffy, uh, and I'm gonna draw little doodles to help out. So next, we're talking to their network. Now we've 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 made it through uh, the DHCP, and we've had NAT, and our firewall is cool. And now we hit the DNS server, and the DNS server let us know what IP to hit to talk. And now we do the TCP handshake. Uh, and these are supposed to go, you know, you didn't see that. But first, let's talk about packets. So packets is how the, the TCP IP model sort of like layers information together. So you've got, um, you've got a bunch of information in the IP header. That's first, uh, maybe I should just draw this. Uh, yeah, let's just doodle a bit and I'll put that over there. Ooh, that's secret. So, um, da -dum, da -dum. what do we got here? Oh gosh, that's very small. Okay, so packets uh, are like little boxes. And uh, let's say first we've got the IP packet. It has a bunch of information stored in each row. Let's say there's two options on the first row four options on the first row. Uh, this is not true. <laughs> uh, but it's storing, for example, uh, the source address, the dest address, and then a bunch of flags about how things need to work with this IP packet, trying to communicate uh, how I want to talk and how I want to be talked back to. Uh, it's very consensual. It's very good boundaries. So attached to the IP packet, then you will link, uh, let's say, a TCP packet onto an IP packet. And then the TCP packet is going to have all sorts of additional information along with its data at the very end, which may be, you know, just a little bit of data. It may be a very large TCP packet with tons of data attached to the end of it. But basically, every time you create a request, you are sort of working with packets. Uh, first, it's just sending the initial sort of IP uh, before the TCP connection is established. And now that this is established, now we're throwing TCP onto the IP packet and talking in that way so that uh, the IP packet is going to help your router uh, know where it needs to go. And then when it comes back, it knows where it needs to go back to. And the TCP packet is more about the connection itself, like you talking to this server and how you're going to do that. So uh, it's a lot more complex than that. Uh, I will let that cat explain uh, more of it to you. Uh, I'm just going to clear this out because next is the, uh, the, the sin, sin, ack, and ack. And basically this is, let's say, whoops, let's, let's say you're like, hey, hi. That packet, the hi packet, is the sin, the original sin. And then it goes to server over here Oh, they still got a smile on their face. They're like, oh, someone said hello to me. So I will send them a sin ack. And the reason they're sort of called that, I believe sin is for synchronize and ack is for acknowledge. And there is more data being transferred with the packet here. Um, there's something called sequence numbers, which are generally random, but, uh, or that the initial one is randomized, but then each each sequential packet should follow in order from there. And the ACK packet always, once it comes back with an ACK, the server's like, hey, let's start on ACK1. And you're like, great, I'm so excited. Yay, I got to send ACK back when I said hello. And then you're going to tell the server, and then, with an ACK packet, 
because you've you've established sin has happened here and then you send act back and now the server is so happy because now they're like oh yay they act me back now we can start talking and then from there on uh you know packets are gonna have sequential act two act three act four etc as continuous packets get exchanged in this stateful remember connection where we're, we're keeping track of what packets go in what order and the reason we do that is because there are uh, things within the packet called the TCP checksum and the checksum is making sure that like okay this packet the the checksum is this so then when it talks to the server again uh, you're like hey was the was the packet this then or was the checksum this and then the server acknowledges yes here's more packets and then it's a constant back and forth between a checksum and then the next packet sequence checksum packet sequence and so you're making sure that the the, the data has remained uh, has retained integrity during the course of that connection so uh, yeah cat explains this really well <laughs> I'm looking forward to some people watching that video uh, Nil is a very sweet human being and very very smart so you will learn a lot more about how the internet works from nil uh, with the links at the end of this video so that's the basics of a tcp connection i want to go over ssl real quick and then we'll look at this actually happening um, but next up we have uh, https and ssl so uh, just to really briefly go over encryption, if you're not super familiar, encryption is awesome. It allows us to keep conversations private, which uh, we all have the right to have. And uh, a lot of very stupid, misguided legislators want to take this right away, and they try it very often, and thank gosh for the wonderful people at the Electronic Frontier Foundation who have fought this for many, many years, but there is currently one up right now called Earn It. Uh, and then there's another one with an even stupider name that uh, Plops mentioned a while back. But uh, we really don't want this to happen because uh, once you ruin encryption, you have basically lost trust in the entire all privacy everywhere becomes at threat when you try and insert ways around encryption. And sure, uh, criminals will use encryption as well, but it is very important for us to retain the right of privacy uh, and not have the government just have back doors into things because uh, we all know that that power probably wouldn't be used very well. And even though criminals can use encryption as well, you can also do good detective work and still catch criminals, uh, but you could also retain the rights of individuals to have privacy with encryption. So that's my soapbox rant about privacy and encryption. But uh, yeah, basically it's just allowing things to stay private. So I wanna talk about this in the context of public and private key infrastructure. This is what's called asymmetric encryption because there are two keys. If you, let's say you had a very secure key and you hand delivered it by mail to someone on the other end and you, you both shared the same key so you could lock data with it and you could unlock data that was locked with it, that's called symmetric key encryption. But because it's very difficult to securely get that key between two places, uh, some brilliant people came up with public key infrastructure and the way it works is let's say uh, Let's say here's Haley with her crazy pink hair and She wants to send a message to someone and It says hey it's me To her bestie who uh, isn't quite sure that it is Haley. Who knows, this message just says, hey, it's me, and it just says like, Haley at the end. But if, uh, if Haley generated a public key, let's say there's, there's her public key, and then we'll use a lock for the private key. If I generated a public and private key pair, I could go ahead and 
with this message, sign it with my private key. I'll label them real quick. And here's my public key. I could sign it with my private key and then attach that to my message. And then uh, my public key, which is public, everyone can see it and use it. It's not hidden information. You can share it all you want. Uh, this person, when they get my message and it says that it's signed by Haley, but is it really? Well, they could they could take the the, the private uh, private key encrypted information, and if they submit the public if they use the public key to unlock it, and it says it really is me, which is let's say that's my signature, then they know that I really sent it because I'm the only one supposedly hopefully who has that private key, and the public key allows me to have someone validate on the other end that it worked. It also allows someone to, if they want to send a message and make sure that it gets to Haley, get to Haley only. If they want to make sure I'm the only one that could read it, they could use my public key to lock this message and then it becomes garble data for anyone that this becomes blah, 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 blah. And nobody can read that once it's locked with my public key until I receive the file. And then I'm like, oh, what did my friend say to me? And I can unlock something encrypted with my public key with my private key. So now I can read it and I can be certain that nowhere in this was it tampered with because it was signed with my public key. So I'm the only one who gets to read it. It's a really brilliant system, and the first few times I've had it explained to me, I could not keep in my head what, well, you signed what with the witch key and the hana of a ba? But uh, after you're more familiar and you've seen it in use a few times, and uh, maybe you, you study the SSL handshake and how that works, and we're going to talk about that right now, uh, maybe it'll make a bit more sense. But uh, don't beat yourself up if it doesn't click all right away. But the idea is you have a public and private key, and that allows uh, encryption on your own end to verify your authenticity that, yes, I sent this. And it also allows someone to send something to you and make sure you're the only one that can see it. So um, when you make a connection, um, so you want to talk to someone and you've made your TCP handshake. So you're going you're gonna to say, client, hello is what that initial SSL handshake starts with. And the server says, oh, you want to talk SSL? I can do that. So it sends you back a server hello with a certificate. And I don't have time to get into certificates, but those are basically trusted authorities that have affirmed that in the case of SSL, that this domain is owned by these people and this is absolutely their public key. I have a certificate connected with my domain that this is their public key absolutely. So when you receive this public key, you know that only they are receiving the message. So they send uh, with their certificate back to me uh, and now I have their public key. So I can generate a random phrase here and send it back. Uh, and, and there's a little bit more with this with Cypher handshakes. We, we don't have to go into that. That's, that's how they decide what uh, security system or encryption algorithm they're going to use. But the, the client now sends something to the server uh, who is super excited because they are the only one that can decode that, that randomized data that the client sent. Uh, now the server uses its private key to find out what what was that random code that the client made. And now we know, like only us know, those two people are the only people who know the secret of where to use the key. Uh, because now you're tracking, again, sort of like TCP with the sequential numbers. Um, anyone who tried to intercept that but didn't have the, the starting value, that random seed, they would get lost in the conversation and they wouldn't be able to decrypt anything because it would be out of order. Um, so it's a, it's a brilliant system. And this is how you secure credit card numbers and stuff. 
Granted, there, there are ways around this, especially if your computer is absolutely compromised uh, and they can just witness you creating the random seed and getting the certificate and, you know, you're screwed there. But in, in most cases, no, no internet service provider is going to be able to look at that data and pull anything out of it. They are going to be pulling definitely metadata out of it. And that's how they track you on the internet. And just, they can guesstimate the kinds of conversations you're having based on the size of the SSL packets. Regardless, that is a conversation for another day. I don't have much time. So I wanted to briefly just show this happening with Wireshark, which is a great tool for uh, looking at your network data. So I've got Wireshark and we're going to be recording off my Wi-Fi. So I will quickly go to google.com and I went to google.com. We're all done. Oh, please stop Wireshark. Please stop. Okay. Let's see if I can find that DNS request. Uh, uh, here we go. Oh, wiki by. No, probably right before that. Uh, I believe this is, no, there should be a client. Hello. <laughs> There's a way to search Wireshark for what I'm looking for. Eh! I want to show the client hello, but I forgot the text. Search uh, client. That's not the right logic. Uh... Man, I don't want to just scroll down here forever, but I really wanted to show you. I think it probably doesn't help that I'm logged into Gmail right now, so I might not have a good old fashioned DNS server. Hello, back and forth. Grr. Let's go to yahoo.com instead, because I do want to show this really badly. Uh, Wireshark. And let's, good God, it's hot in here with all these lights. Uh, let's go to yahoo.com. Okay. We got yahoo.com and boom. So let's look, uh, DNS for Yahoo. And I'm looking for that client. Hello. There should have been an SSL negotiation. Meh. Amazon. Good God. Ad servers. Ah, huh? ad servers. Huh? Ah, more ads. God, ads always look bad. Meh. I think this might be it right here. No, nope, we're still getting TLS right here. Marg. Should be right before this. Good God. Okay. Well, I'm not going to scroll too much further. Regardless, the pattern I'm looking for that I'm having terrible trouble finding, and I wish I just was more familiar with Wireshark's um, language here. So I'm looking for a DNS request followed by TCP SYN SYNAC. God, I can just look for the SYNAC. But I need to Google for how to find SYNAC in Wireshark because it has been far too long. Uh, TCP flags looks for SYNAC packets. Perfect. Okay, so these are all the Synax. One of these is Yahoo, but without the uh, corresponding, let's see, that's 53, 5390. So we were right around here. Arg, I'm not gonna push you through it. I really wanted to show that and it works perfectly fine in the demo, of course, but I don't think I was logged into uh, Oh, just type DNS in the filter field. Thank you, Plops. Dear God, where is the first Yahoo? God, there's so many. Okay, I think this is it right here. 25, 25, 32. Okay, so I was way off. 
But I should be seeing TLS right after this. Good God, it's because there's so many ads. But yeah, there's the initial DNS request for yahoo.com. You can see my, my IP address speaking first to my router. See, it's doing the query for yahoo.com. Where is that? So it asks my gateway. Uh, my gateway comes back and reports back. Here's the IP address, 72.30.35.10. So I should be able to, 72.30.35.10. Uh, plops, help me out here. What's the, uh, I want IP on both sides. Oh yeah, my streaming traffic, That that's not helping. Uh, I just follow TCP stream. Oh yeah, that's the right click crap. Uh, follow. Kind of what I uh, I wanted to show I wanted to show the the, the server hello with the TLS uh, build up and breakdown. Regardless, you can do this yourself. Um, man, and my demo worked perfectly. I had a super clean, just like uh, uh, TCP syn synac ack, and then right afterwards uh, TLS 1.2. Server hello, or client hello, server hello, and then everything after that was uh, perfectly encrypted. But because uh, I'm imagining because Yahoo has CDNs that are serving its content, uh, it's giving me more than just the, the Yahoo IP address. Like you can see, this is supposedly the entire Yahoo conversation, but it connected to so many other IP addresses. Yeah, I caught the redirect. Um, so it, it <laughs> it's not quite as simple. As you saw while I was scrolling through all that crap, there was tons of redirectors through ad traffic, which always is the bane of my existence as a SOC analyst, is <laughs> sorting. It's like everything looks terrible when it's sorted through ad redirectors. But uh, I should have found a simpler site to use that was just text uh, and HTTPS. But I don't want to ramble too long on that. That's the gist of it. You can watch this happen, and I'm sure there's articles on the internet that go through it. But uh, I suppose it's probably good to see me struggle as well, because uh, it's been a long time since I've used Wireshark. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a fascinating tool in and of itself, and uh, you can learn a lot with it. So that's the majority of that. The last part I just wanted to briefly talk about is once that connection has been made, now we're talking the magic that makes everything happen. So then we're sending uh, HTTP requests, which uh, some of the most common are connect, get, and post. Get is where you're like, I want uh, connect is obviously connecting. Uh, we've started a relationship and now I want some files from you or want you to do something. Uh, so then a get uh, is going to be retrieving uh, something from something else and post is sending data to it. You can send data with a get and that's often how PHP works. There's like uh, sometimes in a URL you can see like uh, blah.php question mark v equals uh, YouTube does this even. Um, with uh, the, the V equals and then that hash of the video hash. That's basically a post. You're telling it, you, you are giving the server information, but in this context, you're sending a get that tells what you want so that you get the uh, video back. Um, and then uh, I wish I had an example for this, but I knew I'd run out of time, is the status codes. And I would, I would go and look these up uh, yourself and get familiar with them uh, because it's very handy about uh, how what happened when that traffic was received or not. Um, they generally get grouped into uh, pairings based off of their three digit codes. Uh, so uh, the 200 series is uh, the thing generally went okay. Uh, a 200 is a an HTTP request for did it. I did the thing, I got the request and I served it, great. Um, a 300 series request is for redirects where something got moved or I sent them somewhere else. Uh, the 400 series, the one you're probably familiar with is the 404, file not found. Uh, that usually means uh, the, the request that the client sent doesn't make sense. I don't know what to do with you. Um, there are other 400 requests that are similar. And lastly is the 500 series, which is usually there's a problem on the server end. Uh, 
uh, internal server error, I believe, is 503. And that usually means the server is overloaded, but it can mean all sorts of different things. Regardless, once the TCP handshake has happened, and then the SSL handshake to encrypt all of this traffic, now you can talk with HTTP and start sending files back and forth. So when, when you have made that TCP handshake and sealed it with a website, now you're requesting files through HTTP and you get those all back and your browser displays them on the application layer and you get to interact with the website. So I sort of went really fast with that because the Wireshark demo did not succeed. Uh, and I think the last thing, yeah, basic, at that point you are now able to receive and trans transmit information with what you're trying to talk to. So all that to say, um, let's do the quiz. So if you are not familiar with the quiz, you're going to go to kahoot.it and you're going to put in this number that I provide momentarily. Mm -hmm. All right, so go to kahoot.it and then, oh God, I'm turning the music off. Uh, and then enter this PIN number, 221-841, and you will enter our little game lobby and get ready to fight your friends for the glory and the points. And the points don't matter that much, but they matter in the context of who takes home the glory. Pixel and Plops, welcome back. I think Plops, you used to type out Plopa Waffles, but now that I've called you Plops enough, <laughs> it's just Plops. Negihama, welcome back. Thank you for witnessing my Wireshark spectacle. Uh, we'll leave it open a little bit longer. And then we shall start things up. Yeah, Plops, thank you for some of the direction there with Wireshark. I, you know, I did my demo twice, uh, but yeah, with the streaming traffic in there and then Google when I was already logged into Gmail and then I used Yahoo as like my backup and just got blasted with ad traffic. So that did not go as planned. Find a simpler text-based website next time, Haley. <laughs> but uh, I always find, you know, these, these misdirections and failures are actually huge learning experiences and it makes it clear to people that uh, aren't yet professionals that uh, we do all sorts of dumb stuff all the time. All right, well I guess it's just you three, so I'm going to click the start button, but everybody gets a trophy uh, unless someone joins in the middle and overtakes you. So I'll make this full screen. So double the points, because there's multiple options. What are some of the OSI layers? The acronym was people don't need those stupid packets anyway, was my favorite acronym. We've got four of them up there, or do we only have one of them up there? Maybe just two, or maybe there's three. Yay! All of you got it. Yeah, Ethernet was the uh, the trickster one in there. But physical, that's the uh, data out in space application. That's the thing that we see at the very end that we interact with. And session, that's the thing TCP likes to make a stateful connection. Alrighty, Nagihama a little bit ahead, quick on the draw. Uh, what RFC describes the private IP space? It's a number. It's four numbers. Sounds kind of like an address because you can say two combined numbers together. I don't know what else to say. Uh, you should learn this one. It's a good one. And reading it's pretty fascinating too. You can see them discuss the structure. 
Yeah, so that's RFC 1918. So close. Ooh, 1149. Is that one of the April Fool's ones? <laughs> Is that the evil bit? Uh, usually every April Fool's, there's a there's a funny RFC that's uh, just goofy and silly. Oh, avian pigeons. Oh, that is definitely an advanced internet protocol. <laughs> I didn't know about that one. There, there's the, what, the teapot protocol is one of the RFCs. Uh, the evil bit is my favorite one. Uh, where you just set the evil bit if it's bad traffic. Otherwise, just leave the evil bit. And it actually exists. You could use the evil bit. <laughs> uh, we don't use IPv4 anymore. It's silly. Yeah, that's not true. We're going to be using it for a long time to come, I'm almost certain, uh, especially for private networks. Uh, looks like you're all on the ball, this one. Oh, puzzles. Everyone hates puzzles. Let's try and get out of the way of the answer. This always... What is the correct order of a common outbound TCP request? Let's see, we've got SYN, ACK, SYNAC and DNS. So what's going to go first in that combination there? Mm -hmm. Try not to stay too... The puzzle thing is always just right there. Oh, I know these puzzles are... I think it's just a way I think I get sadistic joy out of trying to see if anyone can even get these right. <laughs> because it sounds like with the app, you're like just seeing the symbols and not the answers. So you have to like look up and down to match them up and it sounds very difficult, but I believe in you. And yes, the order would be a DNS first. Got to find out where that IP address is. And now that we have an IP address, then we're going to start with the SYN. Server's going to send, I got your SYN, here's an ACK, and then you're going to send, I got the SYN ACK, here's an ACK. So that is the order there. Good job, y'all, puzzling it out. True or false, encryption can be easily bypassed or cracked. It's kind of just a pointless thing that nerds complain about. Really, we should give the U.S. government access to all encryption, because that would make us safe. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's false. Encryption can be, and it really depends on the type of encryption, but it makes things far more difficult. Alrighty, another quiz, double the points. Uh, uh, what are some things your router does for you? Uh, let's see, we've got NAT, Network Address Translation. We've got DHCP, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. We've got SSL. And we've got Le Firewall. And it looks like Shield Yata is, or Yata is asking for help. I don't know what you need help with, Yata, but, uh, yeah, I... I mean, I suppose you could say it, ha it hands the SSL traffic to you, but the SSL traffic is really between you, like the, the, the machine that is generating the request and the thing it is sending it to. Uh, your router doesn't generate that secret word that the, com the server decodes with its private key to start the uh, sequence. But uh, I can see how that's kind of an answer, but uh, yeah, it's just not SSL in that case. Sorry, I tried to get tricksy. Uh, true or false, you must not share and you must securely store your private key. Or is that the one you give to everyone? Do you give your private key to everybody? It's a private key. So that means I shouldn't give it to everybody. Uh, yeah, the, the public key is the one that you can hand out willy-nilly. That's uh, actually how you're going to get people to talk to you securely. 
but your private key has to be super secure as much as possible. And then two more questions, y'all. Uh, what are some HTTP methods? I know we went over this very, very quick, but uh, we've got connect, get, leave, and answer. What is the answer? Hmm. Yeah, so connect and get are at least two of them. There are a few more. I think head and options, get, connect, push, post, put. Uh, there's not many though. And uh, looks like we're coming in on the final stretch here. MX records. Oh, I didn't talk to this very well. This one's a gimme. I'll tell you that MX records do not tie don domain names to IP addresses. Oh, learning point of thing I forgot to mention during the DNS part. Uh, MX records are mail exchange records. And uh, yes, you did it. You got the answer. Good job. Um, I forgot to mention this during the DNS part. Um, I was feeling a little rushed, um, but the, the, the records, actually, I just want to show real quick. Uh, didn't I have central ops? Yeah. So the, the A record is what ties the IP address to a domain name. So when I typed google.com, uh, they have a bunch of IPs, but in this case, it gave me the A record, which tells me the IP address I need to talk to. Um, the quadruple A record is the IPv6 version of that address. And then the MX record is a mail exchange record. So that's more to be with uh, routing mail. Like who do I talk to when it says at google.com? Here's one of Google's uh, mail exchange services. There's a, a bunch of different types of records that do all sorts of cool things. Uh, SPF is one of my favorites. DKIM is another one for email verification. Regardless, last question, which is just a poll. Awesome. Oh, Yahoo joined us at the end. Thank you. Uh, and then a poll. Which aspect of this process were you least familiar with? Internal network happenings, uh, the TCP handshake, SSL and HTTPS, or the whole caboodle? Uh, as you could tell, it's been a little while for me as well. Uh, especially with Wireshark. If Wireshark was one of the answers, that is what I would have selected. Clearly. I'm interested. Yeah, SSL HTTPS. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that people found some use out of that because uh, I think encryption is not only fascinating and super cool, it's also really important and is actually under threat in the United States. Ah, uh, Pixel, bum, 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 bum. in second place, Negehama, and at the top of the charts, it's our friend, our victor, Mr. Plops. Thank you all for joining again. Uh, just real quick at the end here, as I mentioned, there is a cat that not only explains DNS, they also explain the internet. These are two wonderful videos that are so dense with information, but also I think that Nil does a really great job of distilling it. And Nil is also a cat. And uh, cats have a lot to teach us, clearly. So I will be posting that at seventhdirection.com slash curriculum after I feed my cats uh, and talk to them about DNS. And I will be posting those links shortly. Uh, I can, uh, I was going to say I'll post them in the chat, but regardless, uh, you could also just look up Google for a cat explains DNS or a cat explains the internet and you'll find Nils wonderful videos. And lastly, Professor Messer for learning the network plus material or the security plus material is super great. And I highly recommend as always. Thank you, Negihama. Thank you, Pixel. Thank you, Plops, uh, Pond Muncher. All y'all, thank you so much for coming. 
Um, I have got one more class left in this cycle of three seasons, um, as they say. And uh, so I, I wanted to get into like nitty gritty stuff with this episode to sort of close things off. Next one will be more of a discussion, hopefully, um, or just sort of chat about things and things we've learned and where we might go. But uh, after that, I'll be taking a deserved, I think, question mark, month break to get the next uh, sequence of videos all ready to go. And then I may be doing like a, a cohort of like people moving through this content, but also doing some of the research projects that I had for people. But I think it might be interesting for folks to watch other people go through content and just feel a little bit more uh, familiar with the material. So uh, I might be doing that too. Regardless, I am looking forward to having you next week and thank you for joining again. And I'll see you later. Bye-bye.